Today is a big day because if you're wondering why we have, like, we're getting ready for a uh, baby shower, um, it's today is our church anniversary. Come on, let's give it up for that. And we want to celebrate what God has done. And be so thankful and to be able to come together. We were going to do it earlier in the month. We decided to kind of push it off a few weeks. So today we're celebrating our anniversary. And just thank you, God, for all he's done. I don't know if you guys know this, but this campus here in Norco, even before Turning Point came, when it was Church on the Hill, started in 1964. And so this place, uh, I believe now, is uh, been uh, doing ministry out, out of this campus now for 60, oh no, 57 years. 57 years. So... Let's give God praise for that, amen? We, uh, Turning Point came here to Norco 12 years ago, so now it's been 12 years for us to be here in Norco, and Turning Point now is now, uh, what is it, 27 years uh, in the making, and so, uh, so thankful for that, and I want to invite up my parents who are our founding pastors. Can we give them a big round of applause? Come on, come on up here. My parents started Turning Point Church in their house, a little teeny house. When I say teeny, I mean it was teeny, little tiny house in Ontario, right across the street from Ontario High School. And it was 1994, and um, at that point, uh, there wasn't a lot. It was just like a little group of people, but they had faith for it, and they planted out from a church in Christian Chapel in Walnut, and uh, God has just been doing amazing things ever since. So I thought I'd just want to honor them today and thank them, but also have them come up and just share a word or just share anything on their heart today just to share with us today because it's our anniversary. Yeah, 1,200 square foot home, little tiny house, 12 people. And uh, no, dining, no dining table. And, uh, yeah, that was our, our great beginnings. Don't despise the small beginnings, right? Hey, big things can come out of little things. And so over the years and just watched how God has just done so many incredible things with so many people. And we wouldn't be here today if it weren't for the faithfulness of so many people and the, the belief and the vision that God years ago. And it uh, just seems like yesterday in so many ways. Um, for many of you, I'll just do one little thing and I'll give it over to Cindy. For many of you, you may not know where the word, where the term Turning Point Church came from. Um, back in the day, in the early days, we noticed that a lot of people were coming to us and with different things, uh, chemical addictions, uh, issues with their past, financial issues, and so on and so forth. And they were, and they were turning those situations around. And it was happening like at a, at a rapid rate with, a, with several people. And it kind of culminated with this one particular woman who had been coming to church uh, for, for a while, and she was praying for her marriage to get back together. And so we were praying with her but, uh, and standing with her, but, you know, find, you know, after a while, I just asked her some of the details about it. And she said, well, actually, we're, we're divorced. And I said, oh. So, you know, because that gets into dicey things, like you're now you're praying for somebody else to get a divorce, so you can get remarried, you know, whoa. So she said, no, 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 neither one of us have gotten remarried, and that was seven years ago. So she said, I'm, but, he, but he's dating someone right now, but I'm praying that we get back together after seven years of being divorced. I said, all right, I, I can believe for that. So we kept praying with her and so forth. Long story short, they got back together uh, through an incredible set of circumstances, and we ended up doing their marriage ceremony on a Sunday morning during the service. They came down the aisle, and we, and we had a Sunday morning service of celebration and, and um, marry, remarrying them back together again. And it was sometime after that that we decided, you know what, this, this church, and this is before there was a TV show called The Turning Point. This is before any, we, we, have, we have it copyrighted, trust me. People sometimes call us and ask us if they can use our name because our, our name list, is listed first on the copyright. So we, we, uh, we just felt like that was uh, something that the Lord put on our heart to do. So we named it the Turning Point Church. And, man, it's just been flat out ever since. So God's been good all these years. I think probably, that's right. The biggest highlight was when we started out, we were actually associate pastors at a, a rather large church over in Walnut at the time. And um, it was not a popular thing that the Lord had told us to go out and plant a church. And people thought we were nuts. And it, and it didn't make any sense. And they're like, you're doing so much for the Lord now where you're at. And, but we had a heart for evangelism and still to do today. And uh, I think that's probably the best fruit that we've had is we've seen so many of you get saved here 
at Turning Point, and you've led your family and your friends and are continuing to. And yes, I think every elder that's ever been in our church, leader that's been in our church, got saved in our church. And then were raised up as leaders to serve the Lord. So, but I'd like to turn the page just looking forward a little bit this morning. I'm a kind of forward, uh, front-footed person, and I'm always looking at what's next, what's the Lord doing next. And as we were worshiping this morning, I just felt the Holy Spirit keep telling me that we are meant for better things. And uh, Hebrews 6, 9 says, uh, it's Paul that's speaking, and Paul says, I'm convinced or I'm persuaded that you are meant for better things. And uh, then he goes on and he talks about God can't lie, and when he makes a promise, he keeps it. And he reminds them of Abraham, and he says, you know, Abraham was given a promise that he would have a son, a promised son, and then have many children following that. And he had to wait for that promise to be fulfilled. But God fulfilled the promise down to every dot and diddle. And, uh, and we can look back at Joshua and Moses and so many people all through the scripture that encourage us and give us hope that God doesn't lie, that he does do everything that he's promised us. And so I just would challenge you guys to really get hold of the promises of God. There's 7,700 of them here in the Bible. And when you pray, God may speak promises to your heart. And then to stand on them and let them be anchors to your soul. You can read about it later. It's all in Hebrews chapter 6. But it talks about those promises become our hope. They become the anchor to our soul. To survive as a church. This is not the year or the season to be a survivor. So if you're looking to survive, this is not the church for you. But if you're looking to thrive in the presence of God and to be on the winning end, on the winning team, this is a good place for you and your family. And so I just pray every day, Kevin and I both do, that God would continue to bless you and that your roots would go deep into him and that our revelation as a church corporately. And Caleb, we're so proud of you. We are. Hasn't he done a good job this year? So proud of you and Jennifer and all of our elders. And, and God's got many more elders and deacons and leaders in this church. Some of your little kids are going to be the leaders we have in the future. And don't ever hold them back. And just we're going to put ladders in front of all of you people. And we want to see you thrive with God this year. Can everyone just stand right now? I would like for my dad just to pray a blessing over us. I think there's a that he carries as the father of this house and as uh, someone who just uh, pioneered this work. And to me, whenever we can kind of receive some of that, it's just a really important moment. So just, just pray for us, Dad, if you can. You guys just lift your hands like this and just get yourself into a posture of receptivity and just, Father, we just thank you, Lord. Lord, we thank you for all that you've done. Lord, we thank you for all that you're doing. And Lord, we thank you for all that you're going to do. And Lord, right now, Father, we just place before you, Father, our destinies, our future, and our hope, God. Lord, every family, Father, every person is standing here today. Everyone, Lord, who is in the, within the sound of my voice, either listening to it today or listening to this tape years from now. Father, right now, in Jesus' name, Lord, we pray, Father, a blessing. Lord, I pray, Father, send down your blessing. Rain down a blessing, Lord, on your people, Father. 30, 60, 100-fold, Father. Blessing, Lord, greater than they can, they can uh, in, receive, God. Lord, get, let them gather all the jars that they can, God, and fill every single one of them, Lord. As we keep casting our bread upon the pot, water, Lord, let it come back to us on every single wave, Lord. The years that the canker worm destroyed, the years that have been taken away, Lord, I pray, restore them back, Father. Seven times, you said, Lord, that if you identify the thief, that he must receive, uh, restore seven times that which he stole. And so, Lord, right now, we identify the devil as the thief right now. And, Lord, we pray, Father, right now that you come back and restore, Father. Restore back marriages. Restore back joy. Restore back hope. Restore back finances. Restore back relationships, God. Father, in Jesus' name, God, be the God of restoration, Lord. And, Lord, we pray all these things now in Jesus' name. And all God's children said, amen. amen. God bless you. Go Niners. You can be seated. Everything was going so well, and then he just had to... Just the carnality just came out right at the end. Just, I don't know if uh, God's on the, that side today. We'll, we're going to find out. So, <laughs> You know, one of the things I appreciate about our church in Turning Point, and, I, and, I, and I, before I even say this, I want to say this. 
Turning Point is not the answer. We're part of the answer. There's a lot of great churches out there, a lot of faithful people, great pastors, great ministries. And so we never get up here and talk about us and we're the answer for everybody. We're not. We're part of the answer. God has a, a call here. There, there, is, there is something here in this house which I think is important. And when you go for 27 years, you start to, so you start to develop some heritage. You just start to develop some history. You start to develop um, some things that are deeper than, than what's possible when you're, you know, a ministry is only a year or two old. Okay? And not, not that those things are, we should look down on, but I'm just saying there's something different. When you have an Abraham, an Isaac, and a Jacob anointing thing through generations, and when you have a, and, and I just want to say this, number one is that you guys are a part of that legacy. There's hundreds, thousands of people that have been, been ministered by this church that are not here today, and there was a season for them to be here, and God did amazing things in them, and, and they're a part of that legacy, and they're a part of um, that uh, inheritance that we share, but now you, you, you get to reap some of the benefit of this ministry and the inheritance that, that's, that's come before you and the ground that was um, that was dug up and the wells that were dug before you, before you got here. And so, but what I want to say is that I believe that this house is a house that can be a place um, of restoration for people, a place where you can come and get restored, a place where you can come because there's a foundation here where God can really do a, a turning point thing in your life. And um, we, we don't want to rest on our laurels. We don't want to say, well, God did all these things, and we're just going to keep doing what we did. And keep, you know, we've got to go back and redig the wells. We've got to go back and go dig deeper every single year. And so we're pushing forward. We're looking toward the future. We're not dwelling on the past. But I just want to say, if you're part of this church, you, uh, I really believe uh, you will be blessed. And I believe that you're blessed to be in this house, not because I'm special or my parents are special, but because God's in this place. And and God blesses faithful people and houses of, of worship like this. And so, and it's something that I've been aware of more than ever. And I just want to say wherever you're at right now, wherever you're at in your journey, if you're new to here at Turning Point over the last couple of months, or maybe you've been coming here for 10 years, is that God's not done with you. And that there's a work that God wants to do in your life. And we want to be a part of it as a church. And we want to hold the ladder for you. We want to minister to you and help you. Um, but there's a, there's a, this is a, a safe place where you can get ministered to. Um, be, get, be, be trained and equipped for the work that God has called you to do. And so um, I'm excited for our future. I'm excited for where we're headed. Uh, more than ever, I believe our best days are ahead of us. Uh, they're not behind us. There's something about looking ahead, knowing that better days are coming that gives you hope. It gives you the courage to take that next step and to say, I'm ready for more. You, we can never sit back and say, well, the, that was, that was when, then, and that was when it was wonderful, and those were the days. These are the days. These are the days we're living in. These are the times. Right now, we're digging the well for the next generation. Right now, you're doing a work for your kids and their kids, and you're beginning your legacy or continuing your legacy at this moment right now. And so we're praying and believing that there's a spiritual work going on in your life and in our church that's going to continue for many more years. And uh, our best days are ahead. Amen? Amen? Amen. If you have your Bibles today, let's go ahead and open up to Exodus chapter 2. Today, I want to talk about your call in, in Christ Jesus or your destiny in God. And I've always kind of shied away from that word destiny because it sounds like there's something like, you know, like the world will talk about, oh, it's my destiny, and it sounds, you know, trendy to say something like that. But what I've realized is that every single one of us have a call of God in our lives, and every single one of you here today have a destiny, a God-ordained destiny in Christ Jesus that's for his glory and for the advancement of his kingdom. And I want us as a church to, to, to live up and all of us search for and try to live in that knowledge of I have a call of God on my life. Not the pastor has a call of God in his life, not other people around me or the church as a whole, but me, me and my family, I've been called by God and I have a destiny in Christ Jesus. God has called me to something bigger than, than myself. And I want to read today out of Exodus chapter 2 about the story of Moses and how God called Moses. And you guys know the story about the, the burning bush. But I was drawn to the scripture this week, and I want to do a little bit of some recap. If you read Genesis chapter 1, you get some of the, some of the recap of, of Moses' birth and how he came to be. Moses came from a, he was a Hebrew man. He came from um, parents 
who were Levites. And so they were like, you know, probably served or had that kind of like heritage inside of them. And they were, they were the, what happened was, is after all the, the, the Jews had got, there was a big famine and God had used Joseph to bring all the Israelites, all the Hebrews into, um, to, into Egypt so that they could be saved from a, a very bad famine. And what happened was that it was part of God's design to save them and they began to multiply. But what happened was the, the Pharaoh or the king that was in charge had died and passed away and a new generation came and there was animosity from the Egyptians toward the Jews. And they said, you know what? These guys are multiplying a lot. Literally, that's what it says in scripture. They were threatened by the fact that they were having so many kids and they were multiplying so much. Their numbers were much greater than the Egyptians in the Egyptians' home. And so they said, we need to do something about this. And they, they decided in their hearts to make them slaves, to enslave their brothers that, that they had invited in at one point, but now they're going to enslave them and, make, uh, and, and, and be their masters. And they were so threatened that the, the Pharaoh at the time said, I want to, everyone to start killing the, the, the boys. So when a boy is born, he needs to be murdered. He needs, we need to end his life. Because we need to stop this, like, re, you know, this crazy, out, you know, it's out of control, this uh, reproduction that's happening. And so God's hand moved, and God allowed um, uh, people, women, uh, who, who were um, helping births and stuff, and they said, okay, we're going to help you. We're going to do what the Pharaoh said. But secretly, they were not. They were sparing the lives of God's people. And, and even in those situations, God's hand was there. Well, Moses was one of those boys. And I said all that to say this. They're living in a land of captivity, and here is Moses who's born, and he's supposed to be killed. His, his, his life is supposed to be over and ended when he's born. If he's not a woman, he's supposed to be killed. And so his mom had tried to hit him for a few months, and she tried to hide him and keep it a secret. But eventually, you know, it's, it's going to come out like this boy's born, and someone's going to find out. And so she, she, she says, I'm going to put him in a basket and put him in the Nile River, and I'm going to basically try to work it out to where he's going to needs, and then someone in Pharaoh's house is going to find him and adopt him and take him in. And under the guidance of the Lord, she does this, and it ends up working. Pharaoh's daughter finds Moses. Can you imagine putting your three, three-month-old baby in a basket and saying, good luck, put him down the river, and trusting that the Pharaoh, someone in Pharaoh's house who wants to murder all your boys, that, that he's going to end up there and his life is going to be spared. Well, what happens is he finds him and then actually um, ends up saying, I need to find a, a Hebrew mom to, to nurse him. And so she, he, she actually ends up finding Moses' mom to nurse Moses. She, she pays his mom to nurse him. It's an incredible story. It's like, what? How does this even happen? But she was serving in the house. And it, God worked it out where now she was still going to get to care, care for him and see him, but now she was getting paid for it. Well, what happened was after he was nursed, Pharaoh's daughter adopted him in. So he became part of Pharaoh's house. So here's Pharaoh, the king Pharaoh, and here is Moses in his house. Unknowingly, here's this boy. He was going to deliver the Hebrew nation, deliver all the Jews out of, of Egypt in his house. Okay, you guys with me? So from a very young age, God had his hand on Moses. God had his hand on Moses. He could have been killed. He could have been drowned. He could have been abandoned. He could have been all kinds of things. He could have been, his identity could have been discovered. But all those things did not happen because from a young age, there was a call of God in his life. Every life is precious to the Lord. Amen. Every child is precious to the Lord. And every person, from, even from a young age, they have a call of God on their life and a destiny in Christ Jesus. Even though it's not fully known, God works out. There's a divine intervention where God's working out things for our benefit and for our plans so that we can reach our destiny in Christ Jesus. So he grows up in this house, and it says in, in Genesis chap, uh, Exodus chapter 1 that later on he grew up and he went out to go check on his people who were being, you know, um, enslaved. He wanted to go see how they were doing. And he goes out there and he sees... Two Egyptian men, or the, the uh, Egyptian just beating these uh, Hebrew men. And he got so mad that he, he decided in his heart, he looked around, made sure the coast was clear, and he killed the Egyptian that was beating up on his brothers. He killed him, he murdered him. And so the next day, he found out that people had saw him. 
And the, he, he was nervous that the word would spread. Well, the word did spread. Pharaoh found out. And Pharaoh has sought in his heart to then kill Moses because he had betrayed the Egyptians. And so what did he do? Well, you know, when you get in trouble, what are you supposed to do? Run away. Just kidding. That's what you do when you're kids, right? When you're kids and like, you know, you see something like run, just, you don't think about it, you just run, right? You didn't even do anything wrong, you're just gonna run, right? Well, he ran far away, away from the, the, the uh, Pharaoh and their kingdom, and he ended up in the wilderness, and he, and he ends up in, the, in, in, in um, finding um, this man named Jethro, and he was a priest in Midian. And what happens is he ends up finding this guy, ends up being, start working for him, uh, underneath him, marries his daughter, and start, starts a family, and now he has a new life. So he had a life before. He had one life as an Egyptian prince, and now he has a new life as a shepherd, working for someone else, marrying a pastor's daughter, a whole new life. And he had, he had, he had worked this out. And in the midst of that, Exodus chapter two happens. You guys with me? Okay, Exodus chapter two, let's read it together. Verse one, it says, one day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai. I love that he's at this place because think about all that God did at Mount Sinai. Like in the future, that was where he was going to get the Ten Commandments. That was where he was going to go pray and meet with God. And, and actually, remember we read last week, and I think it was Exodus, or three weeks ago, in Exodus chapter 33, where he, he saw the presence of God. That was at Mount Sinai. So he's, he's, he's at the, he doesn't even know, but God has a future for him in that place right there. But here he is, and he meets God on the mountain of God, Mount Sinai, as, just as a shepherd, minding his own business with his new life, his new family, his new job. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, amazing, Moses said to himself, why isn't that bush burning up? I must go see it. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am, Moses replied. Do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. I am the Lord, the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It is a land flowing with milk and honey and the land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, and Hivites, and Jebusites now live. Look, verse nine, look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me and I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abused them. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people, Israel, out of Egypt. Wow, that's a lot. Now, I'm not gonna be able to read the rest of the story, but you guys know some of the story, but it goes on for a couple chapters, this conversation between Moses and God. It is the moment where Moses realizes his calling and destiny. It's a, maybe a turning point moment in his life, you can call it, but this is a moment where everything that in his life had kind of come to this moment, and now he was realizing that there was a greater call, a greater purpose in his life that was beyond just being a prince, was beyond just being a dad, was beyond just being a shepherd, having a good job, having a good family. It was beyond all those things. There was a call of God in his life, and God used, I love how God uses the natural to reveal the supernatural. He uses a bush and speaks from it. A lot of times God will speak to us and show us the call of God in our lives just through natural means, just through regular things, regular people. But God can do supernatural things and reveal it. There was a purpose to Moses' life. 
The time in Pharaoh's house, Pharaoh's home, was part of God's plan. He was raised both a Hebrew and a Pharaoh because he was gonna be the one to go back with that knowledge, understanding the inner workings of that family. He was the only one qualified and, and, and the only one that was prepared by God to do so. It was by God's design that he was in that house for that season. Then I actually think about, I started thinking about this this morning, thinking about the fact that he went to Midian and he worked for Jethro, who was a priest. And think about that. How awesome was that? Here this, here's this guy on the run, just committed murder, leaving his life behind, and now he gets to go work for a priest? That would have been good for Moses. Am I right? Think about that. He would have been spent years with Jethro. He would have spent years in the presence of this priest and been in his presence and been around him and ministered to him. Both those seasons, while they are so extremely different, were both important for the call of God for the third part of his season that God was taking him into. So what the season you're in now, what we've got to realize is that because if you have a call of God in your life, and every single one of you here today has a call of God in your life, if you have a call of God in your life, that means right now God's doing things to get you ready for your future. God's doing things now to get you ready for more that he has. Now, I believe that the call of God is not just one big thing. Now, a lot of times we look at scripture and we see one big thing, one big moment. And you're called to bring the people out of Israel. You're called to do this. For a lot of us, it's going to be many things in different seasons, many different moments, and many different opportunities that you're going to be ministering to. But I know this, is that from the time you were born to the time you're here today, God has been preparing you. And God has been do, setting things and, and been working in your life and so that you can be equipped and ready for the call of God in your life. It's not by accident. It's not by just happenstance that you're here today or that you're where, where you are now in your life. But God has been preparing you. God can take the bad, the awful, the evil, and God can take the good and all those things to get you ready for your destiny. Isn't that awesome? It's so good to know that God is good like that. Moses was realizing he had a greater purpose in his life. And he was asked to walk away from his new life. Think about that, what that would have been like for him. Go back, tell your wife that. Good luck. What did God say? Who was talking to you? No, nah, I don't know about that. But he had to go back and communicate this. Communicate it to Aaron, communicate it to his father-in-law, he asked for permission to leave. He had communicated it to his wife and saying, we're going to leave. We're going to go to Egypt, of all places. A place where that's not a good place to go to. I mean, that's not a place where Hebrew men were, like, liked. And that, that would have been a, a dangerous place for him to go to. But that's where God had called him. And so he did it. He, 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 told, he stepped out in faith. And um, I just really believe that we have been chosen for such a time as this. That we live in a generation and we live in a time where we need men and women to say yes to the call of God, to say yes to the purposes of God in your life. In this moment, in 2022, God's looking for us as a church to say yes to the purposes of God. Your calling will take you places you never thought you would go. Moses probably never thought he was going back to Egypt. Never. I'm never going back there. I've got a past. I've got, you know, that place is not a safe place. We have things in our mind that we, we condition and that we think of and we decide in our minds, but God's saying, no, I'll take you wherever I please. I'll take you wherever I need to take you for my purposes, right? And so God can take you places, take you and your family to places you never thought were possible, that you never thought you would go to. Some of you guys have never gone back home. You've never gone back to your past. And God's saying that, that through him, the purposes of God, he can take you to your past to bring out new fruit and to bring um, uh, just uh, restoration in areas that you thought there'd never be restoration. God can take you to a new land, take you to a new destiny, a new covenant, and go to new places you never thought were possible because you just never thought about it in your mind. But God's saying, I can take you there. Your destiny will take you places you've never been before. For some of you here at Turning Point, your, your burning bush moment is here at Turning Point. Not everybody, but some of you. You've come to turning point and you've realized that this has been a, a turning point moment that we talked about a second ago. Where God has spoken to you and revealed the purposes of God in your life and for your family. A time where you can say, yes God, I'm going to answer the call. Yeah. 
Moses, though, disagreed with God's choice. And Moses says to God, if you read on, Moses says in chapter, I think it's chapter 3, gets into it. It says, Moses says, well, who am I? Who am I to do this? I, I can't do this. I'm not the right guy. I'm not the one that's supposed to do this. And so he begins to like pretty much argue with God and go back and forth. Not a lot of faith immediately. Moses questions two things, his credibility and his ability. Two things that he brought to the Lord. He says, I have no credibility. He says, when I go back to Israel, his first instruction was to go back to Israel and talk to the elders and tell them first before you go talk to Pharaoh. He says, how am I going to walk in there and have any authority? They're going to be like, who are you? And they're going to ask me, who sent you? And he says, what, you know, and, and what am I supposed to say? Who am I supposed to say that sent me? And he says, tell them the great I am, the I am sent you. You guys know that conversation he had. And, he, and, he, and Moses was scared, and he was like, I, I, I don't, I'm not qualified. I'm not, they're not going to recognize my authority. They're not going to, I have no credibility, standing credibility with them. And God says, no, I will give you credibility. Yeah. I am your credibility. <laughs> the great I am. He doubted that the Israelites would listen to him. So he, he doubted his credibility, and then he doubted, the second thing he doubted was his ability. He says, I'm slow of speech. I'm not quick with words. I'm not good with words. How, you know, I know you want me to communicate these things, but just, I'm not good with it. And so can you imagine God? I mean, God's trying to have patience. God's so patient with us. Yeah. Did you hear what I'm having you do? Did you hear all the good stuff? You immediately start thinking about what's going to stop you or what's going to be hard. We do that so many times. God's saying, I want to do this in your life. I want to do this in your family. And then we're like, but God, but you know, like, I'm like, I have like some plans that I've already got on the calendar. And then like, you know, like, I sometimes get nervous when I talk to people. And God's like, did you hear what I said? I'm going to bring salvation to your people. I'm going to bring them into the new covenant, into a new land. And you're thinking about your speech. You're thinking about what people will think of you. But we do that all the time. And we discredit we discredit ourselves and we look at, down on ourselves and say, well, I don't have the ability and I don't have the credibility. But here's the thing is, God doesn't need you to have the ability or credibility because God gives you credibility. He gives you ability. So what does, does God do? Three things that God does in reply to Moses' concerns. God gave Moses a sign. He gave Moses a partner. And he gave Moses instructions. So number one, he says, God, God says, okay, I'll give you a sign. Take your rod. And then when you throw that on the ground, it's going to turn into a serpent. So when you go to these elders that you're so scared of, when you go to them and tell them the word that I've given you, they're going to ask you, who are you? What kind of credibility do you have? And your credibility your, is going to be a sign that I gave you. You're going to throw your staff, the staff of the Lord, on the floor. It's going to turn into a serpent, and then it will turn back into a, a, the, a, to a staff or to a rod. Second thing was, he says, you take your hand, put it in your shirt, take it out. It's going to have leprosy all over your hands. And then you're going to put it back in your shirt and bring it back out, and it's, not, it's going to be healed again. He said that will be your second sign. So God gave him signs and wonders, two signs. Many more would follow. Many more. He'd part the Red Sea and do all the ten plagues that God would, you know, all the things through Moses. God would do many things. But these were the first two signs to show you that I'm with you. Many times God will do that. God will give us a sign. Okay, God will give us the, the credibility needed. The second thing is, God gave Moses a partner. In, the, in chapter 3, it said God said uh, his anger started to burn toward Moses. He started to get a little frustrated with all this whining and complaining and I can't do this and I can't do that. And he says, okay, your brother, he's actually on the way. You don't know this, but he's on the way right now. And when you see your brother, I want you to greet him and then I want you to tell him everything I said and he'll go with you. And then I will give you the words and I'll give Aaron the words and you guys will be like a team. You guys will work together. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. And so I love that we're not called to do this alone. Yeah. I love that we're not called to do this alone. God's called us into community here at the church yeah. so that your destiny is wrapped up together with other believers. Yeah. We have a destiny and an inheritance that's tied up together here at Turning Point. Yeah. Isn't it wonderful to know that you're not alone? Yeah. You're not facing the enemy alone. Yeah. You're not just on this journey on an island by yourself, but you're in community. You're together. It, it, even though God can do it without the community and without the help, to know that God will give it to us and has given it to us is good for our soul. It's good to know I'm not alone and that the call of God on my life is not just for me, but it's for much more than that. Amen. Amen. Now Moses ended up speaking to Pharaoh and, and, and directly to him. But when he went to go see the elders, Aaron, Aaron spoke. 
Aaron's the one that kind of got the train started. Okay, I just need, I need someone else's faith in the beginning. I need someone else to come alongside me, a brother or sister in Christ, to kind of help me get this train going. And then I'll start to step into my anointing. Later on, Moses didn't need an Aaron. Later on, Moses had a direct relationship with God and had boldness that he walked in and anointing that he walked in. And he didn't need Aaron. But in the beginning, he did. You guys with me? The third thing God gave Moses was instructions. It was God's plan, not Moses' plan. He didn't say, hey, get all these people out of Egypt, and I want you to work on a plan and have it ready for me tomorrow. He said, no, I have a plan. I have instructions. See, I love that. See, I love that God calls us, but he also has a strategy. God has a strategy for you in your life, and that requires prayer. That requires time with God to hear, God, what's your strategy for me and my family? Not just what my calling is, but God, what's the instruction that goes along with it? How am I going to do this? Where am I going to go? What am I going to say? And so it was God's plan. Moses just had to obey the instructions. Just do what God said. Be obedient. I will say this, though. Moses' greatest asset was not a rod. It was not a teammate. It was God. His greatest asset was not, a, a, you know, the miracle of turning that, doing a, signs and wonders. It wasn't having a teammate, Aaron, his brother, with him. It was none of those things. His greatest asset was God. God went with him. God was with Moses. And that is the difference. If you're stepping into the call of God in your life, you got to know this. You, don't, you can have no ability. You can have no credibility. You can have no teammates. You can have nothing going for you. And guess what? You have God. You have God. And when you have God, he is able. And you're able to break through. Amen. Every person has a God-ordained destiny. This is what I see as destiny. Destiny is your customized life calling for which you have been created and ordained to bring God glory and to advance his kingdom. And I want to break that down a little bit this morning. A lot of people, though, they serve the wrong purpose. They don't serve God's purpose in their life. They serve, serve other purpose. They serve man's purpose. They seek popularity or power or stuff and possessions or position. But your destiny is to serve the purpose and the purposes of God. You were created to serve the creator and to advance his kingdom. Amen. You want to know, what am I here for? What's the purpose? The purpose is to serve God and to advance his kingdom. We always say to know God and to make him known. That's the whole thing that we're trying to do. That's the purpose of God in your life. Most people don't want God don't want God's purposes. They want God to serve their purposes. God, I have this purpose. This is my ideas, and I want you to come alongside me and sprinkle your blessing on top of it. See, that's not how it works, though. We get God's plan. We get God's calling and God's destiny in our life, and then he blesses that thing. I love this verse that I came across. It's in Acts chapter 13, verse 36. And it's just a little teeny snippet in Acts about David. It says, now when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep and was buried with his ancestors. And it, just a little teeny glimpse, but it said, David had served God's purposes. It wasn't King David and his purposes and his reign and his legacy and making his impact for his own life and his own family. He served the purposes of God, and because of that, the generation that was with David was blessed. When we serve the purposes of God, we can change our world. You can change your family. You can change your world when you serve the purposes of God. All great men and women can have the same thing in common, is that they said yes to the call of God in their life. A great example of this is in every kitchen you have lots of different appliances, right? You have a refrigerator, a stove, you have a dishwasher. I mean, we have every, I mean, everything now. We have a, even have like a, 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 a thing you plug into the wall and it will open your can for you. Because, you know, who wants to do this, right? I mean, just, you've, you've got everything, right? I mean, all, it's, we, at some point it could be actually become like just too much. I've got too many machines, too many appliances. But every single appliance in your fridge, or in, I'm sorry, in your kitchen has a purpose. You guys with me? The fridge does not heat anything up. It has its, a different purpose. The can opener cannot wash your dishes. And the dishwasher cannot open a can. Every appliance 
was designed, uniquely designed for a purpose. And you know who decided that purpose? The person who created it. The person who created the appliance decided its purpose and destiny and created it for a specific thing. And all these appliances can't do other things. They have a specific calling, a specific thing in your house that they do. The manufacturer decides its purpose, not the appliance. We don't decide, God, our purpose, what I want to do, where I want to go, where I want to live. I think God scoffs at that. There's even a scripture I don't have today with me, but there's a scripture that talks about how man plans all his steps, and I'm going to go to this seat, and I'm going to go to this nation, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do Have you ever met, met someone like that? Okay, maybe just me. But, you know, people just talking out the side of their mouth, that like, I'm going to do this, prideful, I'm going to do that. No, no, no. Uh, when we're called by God, we say, God, what do you want to do? How can I submit to your plans and th- these things? Not just my will, but your will be done. If an appliance stops doing what it's designed to do, it becomes useless. I've got a dishwasher that's on the verge of going. I've got a fridge where it does no longer make ice. It's on the verge. It's like, man, this thing's, this, days are numbered. Because if appliance cannot do what it was designed to do, it serves no purpose. If you don't do what God's called you to do, you have no purpose. No purpose purpose. And who wants to live a life without purpose? Purpose is everything. Purpose gets you out of bed every day. Purpose gives you hope. It gives you happiness and joy of accomplishment because you have a call of God in your life. There's a lot of people, believers who love God and they want, to, they want to serve God, but they don't know their purpose because they don't know what their gifts are and what God wants to do inside of them. If we're not using our gifting, if we're not doing what God has designed us to do, then we're, we don't have a purpose. We're not doing anything. As soon as an appliance doesn't serve its purpose, no longer works. I don't keep it there just for show. I get rid of it. If a musical instrument doesn't actually get played, what's its purpose? A car is made to drive. If a car can no longer drive, it no longer longer is needed. It actually becomes uh, a burden on somebody who's paying taxes on it and doing all these things, trying to, and it doesn't drive, it doesn't work. It was made to drive. A guitar is made to play. Those are the purposes of it. And we need to understand that you have a purpose that God has called you to. God has created every single one of us with a specific purpose and a call of God in our life. No matter how good the car looks, if it doesn't drive, it doesn't have a purpose. I don't want to just be one of those Christians, just look good. That just sounds good. That impresses everybody. No, I want to do good. I want to actually make an impact. Deep down inside of you, don't you want to actually make an impact? I think every person, every human being is born with that desire. Don't you want to make an impact on this world? Don't you want to leave a legacy that's bigger than you? Well, the call of God is bigger than you. It's bigger than me. We want to leave a legacy. We need God. We need to go to him. So I have, real quick, because listen, we got tacos today, and I am not going over. And... That's one way to make people leave your church is tease them with tacos and then don't get out on time. So, and some people are coming off a fast right now, and they're they're still a little little grumpy. They still need some, they need some tacos right now. But so I want to go through these points just real quick as we close. How many guys know you have a purpose and a call of God in your life? Amen. Real quick, number one, your destiny is bigger than you. How do you know? What your destiny is? Well, number one, it's bigger than you. If it's, if, it's, if it's within your own grasp, if you can do without God's help, it's probably not your destiny. A hallmark of God's calling in someone's life is it's bigger than their own ability. The call of God on Moses' life was way bigger than whatever he dreamt or think or imagined or what he thought was possible. It's a hallmark of it. There's a call of God on your life, but it's bigger than you. Your destiny is going to stretch you. It's going to make you uncomfortable. It's going to make you have to change, make you have to maybe go somewhere you never wanted to go before, do something you've never done before. That's part of following the call of God in our life. The destiny is bigger than you. Moses questioned his qualifications. He says, I lack credibility and ability, but God says, I'll be with you. I will give you the words. I'll give you the credibility. Here's the thing. You are not qualified, and neither am I. And a lot of times people say, well, I'm not going to do anything until I get the qualification. I'm not going to serve because I'm not qualified. I don't have the ability. I don't have the credibility. Before the flood, was Noah a qualified boat builder? 
before he built the boat? No, he was the first. He was the only one had done something like that. Before Peter walked on water, was there any class or tutorial on how to walk on water? No, there wasn't, right? Before Goliath, was David a qualified giant builder? Uh, not builder, killer, slayer, murderer, whatever you want to call it. Was David qualified at killing giants? No. Of course not. Because God qualifies the called. He doesn't call the qualified. We're all sitting back like, man, who's going to do that? I, well, I wonder, who's qualified the most? That's not the number one most important thing. Should we be trained? Yes. Should we be, you know, be good uh, Christians that like, study the word and get better at what the, our giftings are? Absolutely. But God's not limited by your unqualifications, right? God's not limited by your inability because he has all the ability. It's about are you called or are you not called? A lot of us start the question with, am I qualified? Am I qualified? Well, if you're waiting for qualification, you're never going to be qualified enough. There's always someone that has more qualification with you than you. There's always, you know, another person that can stand, step in the gap for you. It's not qualification. It's are you called? Am I called? Did God tell me to do it? Then that's enough. You know, if Moses would have sat back and said, you know what, God, I really think we need to rethink this plan and let's sit down and talk about it. No, am I called or am I not? If you're called, then you can do it. That's the biggest question. And our, our destiny is bigger than you, which means it's not just about you. It's about others. It's about adding value and blessing others and doing things for others through God. God empowers us to do mighty things in this world and to advance his kingdom. It's bigger than us. Number two is your destiny is for God's glory. All, every, every single time you look at someone's destiny or calling, it was always for God's glory, not their own glory. So if you want to know, you want to find out what your destiny or calling is, it's for God's glory, no matter what it is. Number three, your destiny is for the advancement of the kingdom. So it's for God's glory and the advancement of the kingdom. Moses was going to be used by God to advance his kingdom, to lead the people of God to a deeper relationship with him and to bring them into covenant and to take them into the promised land. That was God using Moses to advance his kingdom. Your, de your destiny, let me just say this, your destiny is not your job or what you do for a living. It could be part of your destiny. It could be a, a part of it, but that's not your destiny. It's not. I, I just don't believe that. Moses was a shepherd. That's what he did. He was a shepherd. He was trained. But that wasn't his destiny. Paul was a tent maker. Paul the Apostle Paul. He made tents. That was how he got money. But he was not called to be a tent maker. He was not leaving a legacy. We would not know anything about Paul today if he, all he did was make tents. Peter was a fisherman. That was his trade. If he would have stayed a fisherman and not answered the call of God in life, no one would know who Peter is. He would have never made any impact here on earth. Okay, you guys see what I'm saying? What you do for a living is not your destiny, your calling in God. It can be part of it. God can do things through it. But your call of God is bigger. It's about advancing the kingdom. Not about advancing Starbucks. Not about advancing Target, whatever company you work for. It's about advancing the kingdom of God. That is the call of God in your life. Amen. You can be a shepherd. You can be a tent maker. You can be a fisherman. But there's so much more. You, let me say this. What do you want your legacy to be when you're gone? When people are at your funeral and they talk about your life, like, dang, Caleb was the best tent maker. <laughs> and I remember he made this tent and he was just, he got it together so quickly. I was really frustrated and I didn't know what to do. And he came and he made this tent for me. And I told everybody about Caleb and his tent making. It's legendary. Is that going to be my legacy? Man. Caleb made the best coffee. I mean, just, no one made coffee like Caleb. Is that my legacy? You guys hear what I'm saying? Is your legacy going to be fish, tent making, shepherding? Or is your legacy going to do something for the kingdom of God? Your legacy is always wrapped in other people. Serving God and blessing other people. That's how you make a mark. That's how you do something that lasts for generations. Number four, your destiny is for your good. Your destiny is bigger than you. 
It's for God's glory and the advancement of the kingdom, and it's for your good. But see, what a lot of people do is they think that, that my destiny is for my good. And they don't think about the kingdom, and they don't think about God's glory. They think about my good. God is for your good. God, de- that is part of your destiny. But it's not your good without those things. Romans 8.38 says, and we know that all things work together for good. A lot of people just go, dang, that's a great verse. They just stop right there. Just, I don't need to know the rest of the verse. God works everything out for good. There's people who don't even know God that quotes that. Oh, it's going to work out. Everything's going to work out. The universe will, you know, will figure things out for me. And yeah, karma, everything will work out. It's good. If I do good, good things will happen to me. But that's not the end of the scripture, is it? Let's read the rest of it. All things work together for good to those who love God. To those who are what? Called. Come on, somebody. Called. According to his purpose. We, we, no one reads that part. Someone put that on your fridge. Everybody's got the little angel baby that's half naked in your, in your, in your uh, bathroom. God works it all out for good. You're posting on your Instagram. You got all the, all the memes and everything like that. But what about for those who love God and that are called for his purposes? Not my purposes. Not my fame. Not for me, for his purpose and his glory. Someone needs to memorize that scripture. And don't preach it to other people. Preach it to yourself. Kingdom equation. Here's your kingdom equation. I love kingdom equations. I make these things up. I, evil, God, good. God can take anything that's evil and bad. God, when God gets involved, it turns into good. But it's not evil, good. It's not just because something evil is going to become out good. It's because when God gets involved, it becomes good. It's when God's purposes are involved. When he's at work, no matter what you're going through now, no matter how much evil that has come into your life, no matter how much bad thing has come into your life, when God gets involved, it turns into good. That's what it says right here. All things work together for good for those who love God, called according to his purpose. Joseph said it best. We've been learning about Joseph in my discipleship group talking about it, how God redeemed him and did amazing things in his life through so much trouble and so much bad stuff that happened in his life. And in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, Joseph finally reconciled his relationship with his brothers who had sold him into slavery, like wanted to murder him and just been done awful things to him. And Moses, this is, listen to what Joseph says, but as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. You meant it for evil. You meant to do harm to me, but I serve a God that can take that and make it good. Isn't that awesome? In order to bring it about today, to this day, to save many people. So then he says, God meant it for good, so that, not for just me, that's it, just for my good, done, end of the scripture. There we go again, posting the meme without the rest of the context. God turns around from evil into good for me, for, yo, mm, me. No, for why? Why did God do good in Joseph's life? Why? In order to bring it about as it is today, to save many people. Because God was trying to save a a nation. God was trying to save his whole family. And so it wasn't just for the good of Joseph. It was for the good of Joseph, but it was bigger than Joseph. He had a kingdom purpose that was bigger than his life and his own world. It was bigger than that. Joseph knew that. It wasn't just about me, but it was about the big picture. Man. If you are not interested in God's glory or his kingdom and are only interested in your good, then you are not ready to be connected to your destiny. If you're only concerned about your good and being comfortable and making sure God gives you what you need and what you want, you're not ready for your destiny. You're not going to leave an impact here on this earth. You're going to be remembered as the tent maker. You're going to be remembered as a good guy, really good and helpful and made a good coffee. I don't know about you guys, but I want to leave a bigger legacy. I want to leave a bigger legacy and impact the kingdom of God and advance the kingdom of God. You can't skip God to get to good. You can't. You need God. The last point, I'll close with this. Your destiny is now. Your destiny is now. Psalms 90.12 encourages us. So teach us to number our days so so that we may gain a heart of wisdom. 
to literally number our days. Who wants to do that? Let's count it up. The average person lives to 80 years old, and I'm this age, and so let's subtract, and let's count up the days, 365. I've got this many days. I heard one person say it this way. They said, count up how many years you should have left. Get, get that many pieces of paper and stack it up on your table. And every day, take a piece of paper off that stack, crumple it up, and throw it away. To remind yourself that your days are numbered. Now, it might not sound like a very fun exercise. What happens if someone else takes a piece of paper and throws it away? Or something? <laughs> your kids need it for their homework, and all of a sudden, your days are getting less. Kids do that. They take days from your life. I mean, that's just... It's probably more of God just revealing the truth with what's happening in life. But, but there's something about being aware of your end, being aware that, you know, I'm not meant for this world. I have another world I'm going to. My destiny is bigger than this earth. I'm going somewhere. I have a bigger mission, a bigger thing. Our days are numbered. This year in 2022, make your life count for God and his kingdom. Make it count. If you walk out of 2022 with a little bit more money in your bank account and, you know, another toy in your garage, you didn't do anything for the kingdom. Let's make an impact for the kingdom. Let's do something for God. Let's tell someone about Jesus Christ. Let's say, you know what, God, I'm going to do something. I'm going to make an impact. I'm, I'm not just going to be about myself, but I want to live in my destiny and my calling. Our time is now. If you want to find your destiny, though, don't go searching for your destiny. Go searching for God. Your destiny is not in a TED Talk or some kind of podcast or in a good book. It's God who has your destiny. Go to God, seek him, and he will reveal it to you. Amen? Let's pray today. God, we know that we, there's a call of God on this church and all these people. And Lord, God, I just pray you just stir up our hearts today, God, to be hungry, God, for more. God, I pray that you begin to show every single person here today, God, that they are uniquely and wonderfully made, that they have spiritual gifts, things that you've given them, and that, God, you want them to step up into their calling. Lord, like Moses of old, like Paul, the tent maker, or like Peter, the fisherman, God, you've called us something to greater. We're not going to be just fishers of fish. We're going to be fishers of men. There's a greater purpose, a greater calling in my life. And God, I want that. If you want that this morning, just tell God. Say, God, show me your purposes. Show me your plan. Reveal it to me this year. God, I pray this verse in Romans 8.38 over this church today. That God, you are working together all things for the good of the people in this church. For the people, God, who are called according to the, your purpose. God, I pray that you do that in Jesus' name. I pray you do a mighty work in these people, God. Lord, someone here today, God's going to stir your heart this week to share the gospel with somebody this week. You've never, you've been scared. You've, been, you've never told anybody about your faith. This week, God, say, it's time. It's time to step up. It's time to reach out. Some of us have been holding back. We've been on the sidelines. Everybody else has been in the game, and we're on the sidelines. God's saying, it's your time. Jump in the game. It's time to get in the action. God, we just pray yes and amen to that in Jesus' name. Pray yes, God. You stir up the calling of God. There's some people here today, as we were praying this morning, I just felt like God was saying, your call is not finished. My work is not complete. You are not done, but there's more in Christ Jesus. There's better days ahead. There's greater things ahead for you. You're not finished. There's more. In Jesus' name. God, we receive that this morning. God, we want to do all that we can, God, to make you proud and to serve you in your kingdom and to bring you glory. Lastly, I'd love to pray for anybody here today that needs to find a relationship with God. If you do not have a relationship with God and he's not your personal Lord and Savior, I want to pray for you. It's real simple. I can pray for you today. And you can know that you know that you're going to heaven. That you have a place in heaven that God has reserved for you. And that you are now going to enter into a relationship with him. You know you need God. You know when you're done running. Today, if that's you, I want to pray for you. With all eyes closed, just lift your hand. You're ready to say yes to God. You're, you're, you're ready. Just take that next step. Just in faith, just lift your hand right now. Anybody here? Come on, just be bold. Anybody here today? That's me. I want to say yes to God. I want to receive him as my Lord and Savior. 
And God, I just pray that, Lord, we would just go out into the world, go out into our cities in our businesses, God, and just begin to spread the gospel. God, we want to see more and more people receive Christ. God, thank you for what you did this morning. Thank you, God, for all that you're doing. We celebrate, God, the 27 years, and God, we're believing for 27 years that are even greater than before. That the, the, the new things, God, that are sprouting up, God, are even greater than before. God, we thank you, God, and we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's give God praise this morning.